Hey guys, Sammy Monis here. Super excited to be sitting down today with Christina Previtt. She is a hard worker on our HWPO flagship program and she's a pelvic floor specialist. Um, this is a very exciting time for me. I am 23 weeks pregnant currently as we record this podcast. Um, we got connected with Christina a handful of weeks ago. Um, we did a live call with our members to talk a little bit about pelvic floor health, um, how it affects average crossfitters, athletes, uh, as well as people who are pregnant and postpartum. Um, some really cool information came out of that. And then of course, now that I am, I think our first conversation, I was pregnant, but I wasn't public. And then a couple of weeks after I had reached out to Christina and was like, I'm pregnant. So this is even more exciting <laughs> because now I feel like I have questions and it felt so serendipitous. It really like, it was was. like we reached out and it was like right yeah. when you were figuring out that baby was on the way. Yeah. So um, super excited to have her here today. Thank you so much. Excited about some of the content that we put together in the last couple of days that it's going to be hitting our members, um, which I think is going to be super valuable to them. But then also, um, you know, selfishly, I'm like, oh, this is great to have like <laughs> a team of people that I can now come to for questions. You know, we talked about sleep the other night, like laying on my back. I'm a back sleeper. And, you know, of course, like terrified of harming the baby because I woke up, you know, from a sleep on my back and is it okay and all that yeah. stuff. So it's been great to have as a personal resource uh, and yeah. excited to share some stuff with, with people out there. Yeah. I'm just so excited to be able to have this conversation and um, kind of disseminate this through the HWPO platform because you're right. There's so many myths and there is so much fear from pregnant people because of information on the internet and right. things that don't have research to back them up. And it just makes people afraid to move. And we need to move to be healthy and for, for baby to be healthy as long as there's no complications that are telling us that we can't. And so I'm just super excited to be able to talk about some of those things and really try and answer questions that a lot of people are having. One of the things that, you know, first finding out that I was pregnant was so important to continue to work out, to make it a priority. <laughs> I really struggled with exhaustion mm -hmm. at the start and, you know, going from being a person who works out six days a week for at least an hour, if not more, you know, of course, like got friends in the gym. It's like, oh yeah, I'll jump in on that accessory or, oh, you're going to do some rowing intervals. Cool. Um, to then going to, you know, like I was lucky if I was able to work out like twice in a week and that felt like, oh, I felt like I was already failing my baby or, you know, like failing as a person and things like that. Um, and then, then I did, you know, maybe that was like two weeks worth of the guilt of like, man, I just cannot make it into the gym. Yeah. And then it was like, you know what? There was a couple of days I remember just being like, I'm just going to go down there and stretch. Yeah. I'm just going to go down there. And then, of course, you stretch and then you're like, oh, I could. All right. Maybe I'll just I'll just do a couple squats. Yeah. And then you get a couple squats in and then you're like, I'll just like I'm just going to spin and hang out with everybody. And then it's like, cool. I accumulated 20 minutes. Yep. And was just like completely content with if I can just do that, mm -hmm. even on the days that I feel super exhausted, perfect. That's a win. Yep. Um, and so that was like yeah. what a, a solid, you know, first start into that because it was hard, like yeah. adjusting to yeah. what I know of training and working out mm -hmm. and all of that stuff to then yeah. be like, hey, you're going to slow down <laughs> and we're going to force you to slow down yeah. a little bit. Your body's going to tell you. Yeah. I think it's interesting because in the first trimester, one, a lot of people don't say anything about being pregnant yet. So you're like, oh, well, baby isn't really that big. Why am I feeling so tired? Why can I not exercise the way that I used to? And my athlete brain is telling me that I need to be exercising. Right. And you have to think in the first trimester, that is when your blood volume goes up hugely, like 30 to 50%, your blood volume goes up. And it means that you're walking upstairs. You think I'm not, I'm six weeks pregnant. Why am I out of breath? Stairs have never felt more yes, aggressive. I, this shouldn't be exercise for me. I exercise all the time. And it's because, you know, you're trying to develop a placenta and starting all of the baby's systems and all that type of thing. And so when it comes to exercise in the first trimester, if you are feeling good and you have the energy there is no exercise that is kind of off limits, mm -hmm. like unless it's contact sports or something that could put you at a high risk for falling. So when I was pregnant with my daughter, I was competing in weightlifting. I found out I was pregnant, competed two weeks later. And, you know, the, the things go through your mind. Like I'm really aggressively hitting with the snatch. I have a weightlifting belt on. Right. And I was so lucky to talk to a high risk fetal medicine obstetrician. And he said, you know, baby is super far back in your pelvis, like so far and is super little. 
you're okay if your body is okay. And so I was able to compete in a weightlifting meet 10 weeks pregnant with my daughter. That's such a cool thing. And to I just like PR like my have, snatch yeah. and it's like, yeah. it's so funny, but the fatigue was unreal. I would do my lifting session and then I'm a physical therapist. So in between clients, my husband would always find me like on the, the beds in our clinic, just trying to get as much rest time as I could. And so when I'm working with patients or working with clients, that those are the things that we talk about is one athlete brain, you know, your body's going to tell you to stop when you need to. The rebound fatigue, you know, you're tired after a training session, right. but like 5X that when yeah. you're pregnant, <laughs> like you had a hard training session. Like I was down for the count certain, certain times and that worked okay with my first because I was able to go home and sleep on the couch. Mm -hmm. That didn't work with my second. Well, right. Because <laughs> when you go home, yeah. you're then tending to your first. Right. right. Yeah, totally. You don't like, finish work and your, your toddler is like, mom, like, come yeah, on. This is playtime. This yeah. is like, this I'm, is me and you time. Like, yeah, let's go. We're... Um, and so the second pregnancy for me was, was even more tiring than the first. And then around nausea, like we talk about morning sickness, but it's really all day sickness. Mm -hmm. Most of the time people will feel worse when they haven't eaten, which is mm -hmm. why the nutrition thing for athletes, they're craving carbohydrates. They can be really averse to protein like meats. Like I the smell that. of it is just enough to make them want to gag. I couldn't. Yeah. I, we eat a lot of beef in our house, mm -hmm. like chicken for sure, pork, absolutely, but a lot of beef. I mean, I remember making this one dish and like I had to open up all the windows, turn on the fans. Now this is like middle of winter. I had to change my clothes I could like smell it every, it was like in my sweatshirt and I was like, I can't even, it took 90 minutes for me to like yeah. be like, okay, I can have dinner now. Yeah. I ended up eating dinner at like 9.45 that night because yeah. I was finally like, I can't smell it anymore and my appetite is back. And good for you for actually oh being able to eat it God, because some people can't. I got halfway through. It was yeah. a good effort. And then I was like, I'll have a protein shake before I go to bed. I was just like, I can't do it. I, my husband, when I was pregnant with my daughter in the first trimester, had made uh, turkey burgers and I smelled it and instantly went, Bleh. and he he was so like <laughs> upset. He's like, "Thanks for ruining it for I me." Know. I was like, "Listen, yeah, um, like, he's honey, gonna hate I'm me sure for telling that story, but I can't." <laughs> yeah, I'm really fortunate that I did not have any sort of sickness. I had like that one experience was like the only one time that I really felt like aversion. And then it was mostly just like knowing, okay, I have to eat more. I, I just, I didn't really have an appetite. So I, I wasn't nauseous. I just didn't, food yeah. was just not, you know, everyone's like, aren't you supposed to be craving a bunch of stuff? I'm like, I don't know when that's going to kick in because I just don't even want anything. Yeah. Everything I was eating was like, okay, let me just like have a protein shake, a fuel for fire, like anything to just keep me eating. And yeah. then if I had any sort of like, oh, you know what I really want? I was like, I need to have that immediately. <laughs> not not because I was craving it really, but just because I was interested in food. Yes. It was like, as soon as I was interested, I'm like, cool, great. That's what we're going to have. Yeah. Like meatball subs for whatever reason. It was cool. like, you know what I want? Meatball sub. Mad Had though. it like three <laughs> times in one week because I'm like, it's the only thing I want. Yep. I just, so you whatever. didn't have cravings. You just didn't know it. Yeah. It was just like, yeah, I didn't notice the pattern until now. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So crazy how that stuff is well, like so different for everybody. Yeah. And the carbohydrates, it makes sense, right? Your fatigue is high. You may be coming down on the caffeine consumption if you were a higher, like you can have coffee during pregnancy, mm -hmm. but the levels or thresholds are lower than some athletes Most who are people, crushing a lot of caffeine. Yes, for sure. And all of that is making your body crave carbohydrates to try and keep you more alert and awake. So it all just makes sense. Totally. Yeah. So it's just crazy the difference between like going from being super, super active and all of a sudden there feels like this halt of hey, all of the things that you once loved, like you're going to be way too tired to do them. And then it, it honestly, there were a couple people that were like, hey, you know, you're this exhaustion. It, it's all of a sudden overnight just going to go away. But it doesn't really feel like that in the moment. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, we ended up having to tell like a lot of our employees, we, we work out of our house. I mean, now we work out of this building, which yeah. is super exciting. But most of the workday is spent out of our house. We have employees, you know, working at the kitchen island and in and out of the house all day, uh, you know, from athletes training in the in the garage in the in the basement. And yep. it was like, I have to tell people way earlier than I maybe would normally because how weird would that look if it's like, <laughs> oh, cool, Jake and Josh are sitting at the island and like, I'm going to go take a nap because yeah. I have to. I was like <laughs> yeah. sleeping 10 and a half hours a night. Yep. 
And then I had, to, I could not get through the day. It yep. was like one one thirty. I'm like, I gotta go lay down. Yep. It was wild. Yep. And then it really did. Like I woke up one day and I was like, oh, I I'm not energy. tired. Yeah. I feel great. <laughs> yep. And then it was You're like, like rounding that corner okay, into the second trimester. Second trimester. Here we are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody was like, oh, second trimester is the sweet spot. And I am feeling that. Yes. I love it. I'm yes. like, my mom, so I'm one of five. Mm -hmm. My mom had five, five babies. Yep. Um, she has always said, she's like, I loved being pregnant. And it's just like, what a funny thing to just be like, oh, I loved being pregnant. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I get it. I love being pregnant. Yeah. It's just like. I don't know. I just like feel so good in my body. And yeah. yeah, it's like other than just trying to figure out how to wear clothes right now, <laughs> which I feel like will come. Yep. And as soon as you figure it out, you're going to get bigger and yep. then you're going to have to figure it out again and whatever. But I don't know. I'm just yeah. like, oh, now, yeah. now I'm just like feeling good. Yeah. I think pregnancy can go in like either way too. It can be very healing for some people who have had very rigid like nutritional schedules mm -hmm. and things like that. And being pregnant gives them permission to kind of relax a bit with the nutrition side of things. Some people don't do that. And then for others, they can hate yeah. being pregnant I because they're imagine. feeling really bad. Um, you know, I've treated people who feel like they have the flu the entire time. That's hyperemesis gravidarum. And so it really can go both ways. And I think it's so powerful to give permission that – Oh, I love being pregnant. I love mm -hmm. the way that I modify. I feel so good in my skin. But it's also okay if you hate being pregnant and you just can't wait for it to be over. Yeah. And on the people who hate being pregnant side or the people who are resentful or angry or grieving the fact that they have to modify, I I was kind of in the indifferent. I was kind of in the middle. But I definitely saw like my husband, I was an athlete. I've competed pregnant or postpartum in – CrossFit, weightlifting, powerlifting, and I would see my husband not modifying and me having to. And there was like a grief process that mm -hmm. happened with that of having to hold myself back more than I would want to or right. more than I was used to. And, you know, the pendulum swings in pelvic health a lot. And so I always want my clients to know that you, it can be both. Mm -hmm. And your experience in pregnancy is your experience in pregnancy. And I hope it's positive or at least neutral, but I'm here to hold space with you if, if it is something that's negative. And I understand yeah. why those negative feelings come to. And I think that can be really, really powerful. Yeah. I, the only like, I do feel very, I, I recognize that too. You know, I've had friends that are like, oh my gosh, this is whatever, whether it's like, there's like certain random things that pop up in pregnancy rashes and ha and hair loss and and yeah. what is it when like i had like uh, a like, like rosacea gave, yeah gave me like acne or whatever yes like all of I these had a things. client of mine say that i needed to rethink my skin routine i was pregnant nobody knew it and i was like i'm pregnant. like i was just like screaming it in my head and i was yeah. like thank like, wow, you I'll, thank you so I'll, much I'll for that my toner and <laughs> very um <laughs> abrasive comment I appreciate oh, no, I like, of <laughs> yeah. course I remember it four years later like right. my daughter's almost four um so it's just funny how you know those types of things can come up or um people can get really itchy with uh different conditions and stuff so yeah, yeah there's a what bunch is, of, is it called pups um, I had a friend that had something called pups and she had like hives all over her oh, body I don't know about that oh my gosh poor thing oh yeah, yeah that's terrible no, at col cholestasis I think is when okay. you have stuff where your your body just feels itchy all the time mm -hmm. yeah Oh, goodness. Well, all of with all of the good and all of the bad, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, what an amazing thing that our bodies do. I've genuinely never been like more. I'm like, I am there. There's organs growing in my body <laughs> and like and and completely cool. voluntarily. Yep. Like I don't wake up every day and think, you know what? I'm going to make my baby's fingernails today. <laughs> it just happens. Like yep. it's such a crazy thing. Yes. And so one of the things that I felt I think at the beginning when I was super exhausted, I, I felt like this weight of, oh my gosh, I have to be training or I have to be working out in some way, moving my body, doing things that are good for me, but good for baby. And then it was like, I also just look at that as what an incredible time. Like this is, I would never just go and run a marathon. And birth is such an aggressive like event on your body yeah. that why wouldn't we prepare for it? Why wouldn't we yeah, work out absolutely. through and prepare ourselves for it? Um, very similar to like, obviously we are, you know, CrossFit, weightlifting, powerlifting, like our, our, our worlds collide at CrossFit for sure. Yep. 
And within that, it's like, you know, they've always talked about how you're essentially preparing yourself for, yeah. God forbid, something happens in your life. Or, you know, Matt just went through his knee and his recovery after having ACL, MCL, LCL, like all of the repairs done on his knee has been so much better because oh, yeah, he was he so much higher in terms of like his preparation. So yeah. yes, he took a huge hit, but his recovery and his ability totally. to come back has been so much quicker. And, and the research says that too, in terms of exercise and pregnancy guidelines, it's the same as if you weren't pregnant, right. accumulate 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise, 75, like less time if it's vigorous and try and do strength training twice mm -hmm. a week. And it makes sense, right? I was talking to you yesterday and said, at what point in your life do you say, I really wish that I was weaker going into this big <laughs> monumental life right. event? And birth is one of the most transformative moments in a person's life. Like not only do they become a parent and that's transformative mm -hmm. in and of itself, but the physiological process of labor and delivery is very intense. And we see that individuals who are more active tend to do better in labor and delivery and get a smoother start to their postpartum recovery. And, you know, everyone's going to have their own story. And there's a lot of things that happen within labor and delivery that are outside of people's control. We always say, you know, have a birth plan, but don't laminate it because right. stuff happens. Uh, but it's important for us to recognize that for the majority of people that exercise is beneficial mm -hmm. and the people that it isn't their doctor or their midwife or their birth provider, whomever is following them in their care is going to tell them that. Yeah. So the, you know, keyboard warriors that are constantly making comments on pregnant people's bodies is, is tough. And I did a research project. It was a cross-sectional study that looked at heavy lifting during pregnancy. So one of the big things that, especially in the second trimester, third trimester, individuals start getting comments about is lifting heavy. You mm -hmm. shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't lift more than 20 pounds. And it wasn't because that restriction didn't come in because we have evidence to show that it's unsafe. That restriction came in because we didn't have any evidence to tell us it wasn't. Right. And when we don't know, especially in such a protected time in a, a female's life, the answer is no. We're mm -hmm. not going to do something that we don't have evidence to see if it's safe or not. And so myself and a group of collaborators, international collaborators, we did a cross-sectional study that asked women who did lift heavy during their pregnancy to tell us about their outcomes. And our criteria was that you lifted at least at some point in your pregnancy over 85% of your one rep max. Cool. And the reason why we did that, and like the averages were like their deadlift was over 200 pounds. We had almost 700 individuals in the study. These were mostly recreational CrossFitters. These were not our elites. Yep. And we saw that the individuals who were stronger did really well. Like those that continued holding their breath when they lift. That's what people are told to never hold your breath during lifting. They didn't have more rates of pelvic floor issues postpartum than mm -hmm. those that did. And it's not to say that, you know, we're going to just get rid of any modification. Right. But the idea with that study is that we need to stop scaring people. Yeah. We need to guide people so that they are moving in a way that feels good for them. But we, if they hold their breath on a squat, they're not going to spontaneously hurt their pelvic floor. Right. Like none of that is going to happen. And the same is true with people with doming or coning in – the gymnastics movements in CrossFit, people are told, don't ever do sit-ups, don't do planks during pregnancy. We don't want to decondition or make our core weak during pregnancy because it, we see for individuals who have diastasis recti, which is a separation that persists postpartum mm -hmm. of those six-pack muscles, that a lot of our research is showing that those with diastasis recti are weaker than those that don't have diastasis recti. And part of it is also genetics and things like that. But deconditioning during your pregnancy isn't the answer. Right. Crushing toes to bar 38 weeks pregnant probably isn't the answer either. Right. But where's the, um, but there's, where's the middle, right? Yeah. Where's the middle? And we don't need to be afraid if we don't mark cone. I was doing those videos with you yesterday and yeah. actively trying to get you into those positions. You're it not going to. wild to yeah. see too. I was like, no, I don't think I do. Oh my God, I do. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And so we do a little bit of tweaks. We try and get as much of that proper core recruitment as we can. And then we just don't freak out about 
uh, those positions because we want to be able to have strong obliques. Our rectus muscle, even if it's in a more lengthened position than it was before, still needs to be strong. And Mm so we encourage things like, okay, maybe sit-ups cause you to dome or cone, but let's add a band and do band assisted to take some of that stress off your core, but still keep, keep you, you in strong motion. through flexion and extension. Yep. Because then you're newly postpartum, you're feeding baby all the time, and you're in this reclined position. Like, how are you going to get up yeah. with baby in your arms? You're going to do a sit up. Like, you need to do that day one. Right. <laughs> Unless you got a hospital bed in your house. Right, right. But so, some people do, which is kind of <laughs> cool, but you know, we don't have that. And yep. so, you know, some people to get their spouse to help pick them up, but most of the time you're you're doing that sit up anyway. Right. And so if you have that strength, it's just so much better. And what a hard thing too to hear in in terms of like, okay, you become pregnant or you find out that you're mm-hmm. pregnant and then it's like you don't lift more than thirty pounds. And then you're like, Cool, well this is like my second or third child and I've got toddlers crawling all over me and that's just not realistic. Like yeah. what if I just continue to lift? And so that way when real life happens, yeah. I'm not skipping a beat. I can still, yeah. you know, I'm sure it's not comfortable. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have a, a toddler crawling on me um, yeah. during this pregnancy, but it's also like that mm-hmm. I've seen friends, family, yeah. all of that stuff. Like that's just reality to be like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm sorry, honey, I can't pick you up because yeah. mommy's not allowed to <laughs> pick up more than 35 pounds. It's yeah. like, kind of you know yeah. reality is that it just feels so outdated right so just from like a, a generic life never mind <laughs> now you have people that are active that are yeah. like oh I would really love to continue working out yeah so the way that I will tell my clients to to talk to their provider so if they get that statement I usually get them to ask follow-up questions say you know I can pick up 300 pounds off the ground does that 30 pounds still apply to me <laughs> is it a percentage of the max amount that I can lift like when you start asking those questions, Mm -hmm. you're not going to make your provider be defensive because you don't want to be that person. You're, you're trusting them for your pregnancy, your labor delivery. They might just not know you as a whole person. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You don't want them to say like, you know, have reckless abandon and do whatever you want. We want to have some guideposts and the best way is to be as informed as possible. So when you start asking, oh, well, no, not really. Like, it's not a hard, fast rule. Like, you know, my toddler's 35 pounds. Ask that question. Like, can I not pick them up? Mm-hmm. You're going to get the the rare provider that's going to say, yeah, I don't want you to pick up your kid. I've mm-hmm. had that before. Um, I've had pers- people who have had a provider that say you're going to ruin your abs, or your pelvic floor. Again, that's not true. Mm-hmm. But the more we start having collaborative conversations, the better. And then postpartum, like you were saying, I was, I think, three weeks postpartum with my son, we were at the park with my toddler. I was baby wearing him and toddler did what toddler does and did not want to leave the park. Yep. She's 35 pounds. We had walked there. And so I was like four weeks postpartum, picked her up under my arm, had him. And I did like a 50 pound farmer's carry yep. <laughs> from the park home. Listen, kid, we got to And home. she wasn't just mm-hmm. like a... a nice kettlebell that wasn't moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She was an overstimulated, exhausted toddler who was all mad that we were leaving the park. And because I didn't believe that I was going to do something detrimental to my body, mm-hmm. I was just yeah. being a mom. You, you know? just did it. And the last thing that I would want is for some of these misconceptions and false beliefs to make people think that they did permanent reparable damage, yeah. which is not true. Yeah. Definitely felt some fatigue in my pelvic floor after totally. that, still yeah. healing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I had two vaginal deliveries, but I didn't do anything bad. Mm-hmm. And I think that that messaging of females not being as strong or as resilient or somehow less than from a strength perspective can sometimes manifest or start in pregnancy where we start becoming very cautious. Mm-hmm. And I just think as a pelvic floor physical therapist, my job is to give guideposts during pregnancy. Like Mm -hmm. we don't say, well, you're going to stop doing toast bar at 14 weeks Mm -hmm. or you're going to stop doing this at this amount of time. I'm going to say, this is what I want you to look for. So if you are having a hard time managing that coning or doming, we try and coach it out and it's just, you know, not at the level that we're comfortable with, we're going to modify. But we're still going to try and get you hanging from the bar. We're just going to do it in a different way. Yeah. If you are lifting and you're starting to feel heaviness or pain or you are peeing when you're not meaning to pee or you are farting when you're not meaning to fart, mm-hmm. like those are guideposts to tell you that either you're not managing the way that you're bracing well and your pelvic floor is your weak point in your core, so it's showing symptoms, 
or your body is telling you that you're at a threshold that right now your body isn't ready for. Mm -hmm. And those concepts are true in pregnancy. They're true in postpartum and they're true in people that do not have children. And one of the things around pelvic health, we're talking about your pregnancy, but men experience pelvic health issues. Mm -hmm. They may not pee as often because of their pelvis being more narrow than women's, but they get hemorrhoids, they get hernias, and they fart in the bottom of the squat. There was a study that was done in Norwegian elite level powerlifters and weightlifters, and 50% of them had told, had reported that they had become fecal incontinent, which is like losing um, flatulence or it can be stool, but for them it was mostly gas. And that's in our male colleagues, Mm -hmm. right? So that stuff happens to them as well. And then- And it's most commonly at the bottom of the squat or is that just like in general? Yeah. It's where your pelvic floor is just in its most lengthened position. So it tends to be that that spot when they're coming out of the hole. I think we all have gassy friends. So that's why it's like, (laughs) should we be- keeping an eye on them or it's like just in the squat position. Maybe we should talk about you know their diet I mean? a little yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, just checking. Just yeah. making sure. But yeah. things like constipation can affect mm-hmm. men and women and make them more likely to have pelvic floor issues. Yeah. Um, and so addressing, you know, their diet with constipation stuff can be super helpful. And then for our female CrossFitters, you know, our, we have a systematic review that showed that 45 to 50% of individuals who have never had kids will leak with double unders. And... The thing that makes me upset as a provider and a researcher is that if we said 50% of females had knee pain with squatting, everyone would be real mad about it. Totally. They would say, we got to do something about this. Like, how are we going to educate our coaches? Like, what are we going to do? But we have tons of research that are showing that females are peeing in sport and the knee jerk reaction is, well, just don't do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, would you tell that to everyone? Do you think I want to be peeing my pants yeah. in a public setting yeah. while I'm trying to work it out. Right. You think I would change that if I could right. or if I knew right. how to, right? Right. Yeah. So we, there's so much education that needs to happen. Like an example at the games, Scott Panchik and Kenzie Riley were at the games two years ago and Scott had a knee injury mm-hmm. and he was, it was his last year or he said it was his last year and everyone's like, what a hero, you know, really pushing through with his knee pain. Mm-hmm. Kenzie had just had a kid. She came back. She like accidentally made it to the games. Yep. I do doing like that. hourly programming. Yep. It's like, maybe I should try and train for this. Gets to the sprint heavy barbell workout, peed on a heavy clean. She had not had incontinence before. Her and I had done an interview together and the internet like erupted on her. And I was like, it's, it's the same thing. Like right. it's an athlete pushing their body to the extreme. One is pain and one is urine leakage, mm-hmm. but it's a sign of hitting capacities and thresholds and it was just so it was treated so differently yeah and really I mean we remember it more so from like the embarrassing moment in middle school or elementary school when so and so in class pee their pants and it's like oh you know like it's not the same this is you know the completely different issue yeah and so just like with any athlete injuries are part of being a competitive athlete Mm because you're pushing your body to an extreme we know that females who are working under high load high impact, high fatigue are more likely to have pelvic issues. And it's because you're, you're trying to find where your boundaries are. Mm -hmm. And when you push into where those boundaries are, things can happen. And then if you've had a big stretch injury, like a vaginal delivery, or your core has gone through a big stretch with pregnancy, that just creates a risk factor. Mm -hmm. Not again, something that we need to avoid postpartum or during pregnancy, but things that we need to be mindful of and watch volume and just go through that rehab process like we would if it was a knee injury. Right. It's the same thing. We're going to do progressive overload. We're going to coach those movements. We're going to make sure that body is ready. We're going to increase capacity over time. And we're going to try and encourage the movement freedom that people want in their life, whether it's a mom who's wanting to be able to jump on a trampoline with their three kiddos, because that's a big one for mm-hmm. pelvic issues, or it's, you know, someone who's trying to get back to the CrossFit games. We have a lot of mom athletes who are It is. It's wild. It's crazy. I know. When you start to count it up, you're like, oh, I had no idea. Yeah. We have three in the top 10, right? Uh, Annie Thorsauter, Kara, Ariel Lowen, Mm -hmm. Kenzie Riley. She didn't compete last year. Um, But And I'm sure there's more. Oh, yeah. In the teams, for sure. There have been for years years prior. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This has been so exciting. I would love to share if there's any other spots that people can get more information from you. We're for sure going to be doing some more stuff. We're going to have you back once, you know, once I'm taking up a little bit more room in this chair, (laughs) we'll be talking more about the third trimester. And then, of course, you know, like um, postpartum and all of that stuff in recovery. So super excited to get this started. Thank you all for listening about yeah. My pregnancy is going so far and then also yeah. super excited about some of the information that you were able to share today. Yeah. But I would love for you to share if there's um, a, a place that people can go to get more information from you. Yeah, And then absolutely. that way they can, you know, if this for is sure. something that is affecting their life, their fitness, their, you Perfect. know, their yeah. lifestyle, um, I think it'd be great. Yeah. So you can follow me on Instagram at Christina underscore Previt. Um, If you are a pregnant or postpartum athlete, I also uh, own a company called the Barbell Mamas, which does pregnant and postpartum programming in CrossFit, weightlifting, powerlifting with pelvic considerations. So I try to give you those guideposts about if you're leaking, we're going to modify this way. If you're feeling heaviness, modify that way. And if you're an exercise professional or a physical therapist in the rehab space, I also teach a course in pelvic health, specifically speaking to active individuals in CrossFit and in other sports. Um, So I run that through the Institute of Clinical Excellence. So you can find that at Ice Physio. And we have an online, eight-week online course and a two-day live course where we teach you all of these things about how to show up for your clients um, and able to help them through their pelvic health journey or their pregnant and postpartum journey. So awesome. Well, yeah. thank you, thank you so, so much, much for having me. Great. It was so know, fun. So fun. I'm sure we could have continued to talk oh, for absolutely. hours upon hours, but we'll keep this one. A little, <laughs> we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep this one on good time. Um, yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching, viewing. Let us know if there's anything that you guys are interested in for future content. And thank you again. Yeah. Thanks.